the news in the past few weeks are playing right into into your talk today with Cuba, and um, so um, everything that you have said, we've learned so much from. And for people who are not aware of the problems now, I'm glad that you know, we'll be speaking about it. I saw the article last week about the U.S. Embassy people, and I said I have to cut it out, but Jean will know about it before me, so I didn't. Thank you, Jean, for everything that you have ever done here. Uh, before we begin, I always thank all my fellow friends and librarians for all of their help and support. I couldn't do it without them, and Brent, and, and Nancy, and everyone. So thank you all, too. Um, and now, please, we have a lot to learn, so please let's give a great, big, warm welcome to our very special guest. <laughs> Cuban history goes back thousands of years in terms of uh, Native Americans, various tribes uh, settled there. And I guess the first big change, can't blame the United States for this, uh, was uh, Columbus uh, sailing to the New World. And one of the places he came upon was uh, Cuba, and there were Indian tribes there. And uh, his first question to them, you can make yourself understood if you don't know the language, was, where's the gold? <laughs> uh, there wasn't any. There wasn't any. He didn't believe it. And uh, within uh, 10 years, the population of uh, Native Americans on the island uh, was decimated. Uh, it's estimated that when he first arrived, there may have been as many as 250,000. Uh, uh, a century later, there was about 500 uh, left. Uh, some of it was by disease brought by the Europeans. A lot of it was deliberate killing. Deliberate killing when they would not bring the quotas of gold that didn't exist. Now, this became a Spanish colony, and it would be, remain a Spanish colony until, until 1898. Uh, Spain uh, uh, brought uh, slaves from uh, Africa, and the major crop for Cuba was sugar. And when sugar was discovered, with crops like in Cuba, it became all the rage. Europe couldn't get enough of it. It was a very lucrative crop. And so you have the institution of slavery in Cuba for centuries. Where does the United States enter into the picture? Well, basically, after the Civil War, in the later 1860s, the Cuban people rose up against Spain and their colonization. And the United States' response to this uprising by the Cubans was to ignore it, to ignore it. They just fought a civil war, and they felt very little at stake. Certainly, there was no moral issue rising in their minds in terms of the plight of the Cuban people. They ignored it. But when we turn, let's say, to the 1880s, the Cubans rise up once again against Spain. The first uh, uprising was put down, brutally. The second time they rise up, the, the United States plays closer attention to it. What's the difference? A, high, uh, a higher rise of morality? No, no. The difference is that American businessmen had begun to invest in Cuba, buying up sugar plantations, setting up oil refineries outside of Havana. In other words, now they had an economic stake in Cuba. So they do respond to the uprising. One of the great heroes of the up second uprising is the uh, Cuban poet Jose Marti, who had been in exile in New York City, uh, of all places. There's a statue somewhere uh, in New York City of him. He goes back to Cuba to fight for his people. He gets killed, and he's till today's day considered a great national hero. What did the United States do about this second uh, uprising? First under President Grover Cleveland, then afterwards under President <coughs> William McKinley, they said pretty much the same thing to, the, to Spain. And listen carefully to the alternatives they presented to Spain. Either get out of Cuba and give the Cubans their independence, or crush the rebellion once and for all. Now those are two opposite solutions to the problem. But they have one thing in common. 
from the United States point of view, to bring order to the island. To bring order for American business not to be facing this turmoil. Either get out if you can't crush them, or crush them. Again, put issues of morality totally uh, aside. Which brings us to the year 1898. The American battleship, the Maine, is sitting there in Havana Harbor. What's it doing there, one may ask? Well, it's a threat. It's a threat to Spain. It blows up. Blows up. The immediate American reaction is, Spain did it. Even as a young student, I started to question that. Because the question that always should arise is the question of motive. What motive did Spain have to blow up this U.S. battleship? Because if the result is, very likely, war with the United States, it's a war that Spain cannot possibly win. Not possibly. So I've never been able to find the motive for Spain blowing up the Maine. What alternatives do we have? Well, there's a second alternative that presents some kind of motive, that the Cubans did it. Why blow up the U.S. battleship? Well, if it instigates a war between the United States and Spain, Spain loses the war, Cuba gets its independence. There's a logic to that. I must mention, in passing, a third possibility. And that is that the United States blew up its own battleship. That's a shocking thing to say. I understand. It's a shocking thing to say. But in terms of our history, it's not unique. Let me give you, as, as an aside, an example of what I mean. Rebels won the day in Nicaragua, a government that we didn't uh, like, the United States didn't, did not like. So, there was a plan set that was supposed to set in motion. It was set in motion, or, or tried to be, by a name that may, you maybe remember, uh, Colonel Oliver North, Remember that name? Right. Here was the plan. Here was the plan. We would assassinate the U.S. ambassador to Costa Rica. We blame Nicaragua for it as an excuse to go in there and get rid of uh, this government that we didn't like. Somebody said, no, we're not going to do that. But it was definitely in the planning stage. So. The U.S. motive might be a war with Spain, and the United States wins the war, and empire results, which I'll get to in a few minutes. So we have three possibilities. Now, the answer to the question of how the ship blew up is, after what I've just said, very anticlimactic. It probably was an accident, yeah. after all is said and done. Prob what they found out was that the the uh, the um, the heat of the furnacing of the uh, of the of the ship was very close uh, to the magazine of uh, of arms and a very thin wall and too much heat blowing up things and so on. That's the most likely cause of the of the sinking of the uh, battleship. Although I must mention just in passing, just in passing is that when the ship blew up, there were a couple of hundred American sailors on board, and all the officers were ashore. But, but having said that, for historical completeness, it probably was an accident. Now, whether it was an accident or not, the American people blamed Spain. And helping them to blame Spain was a newspaper war going on for circulation. And the two main <laughs> figures here were William Randolph Hearst and his newspapers around the country, and Joseph Pulitzer and his newspapers. And competing with each other for circulation, they responded to what was called a yellow journalism, which is basically scandal mongering, you know, horrific pictures, of, of sensational stories, and so on. And Hearst was probably better at this uh, than Pulitzer uh, was. And so there's the story, which is probably true, is that he had these correspondents in Cuba while the fighting was going on, and Hearst says, I want every atrocity, every detail, 
that's gruesome to be sent to me so I can put it on the front page. <coughs> if you need to exaggerate, that's okay. If you need to make some of it up, that's okay as well. So this newspaper war fully uh, further infuriated the American people in terms of Spain, Spain as the, uh, as the, uh, the culprit. Tensions were heightened even further when the uh, ambassador, the Spanish ambassador to the United States sent a secret telegram to the Spanish government in Madrid, which was intercepted by the United States, and in it, uh, this, uh, this ambassador's name was DeLong, uh, criticizes President McKinley. Uh, he's a weak president. He's giving in to popular, uh, uh, popular outrage and so on. And we made the uh, telegram uh, public, which further infuriated the American uh, people. So, we're in the year 1898, and the United States declares war against Spain. It wasn't much of a war. It was often referred to that as that splendid little war. It only lasted a few months. And the only reason it lasted that long is because the antiquated Spanish fleet is hiding from the American fleet. And it took a while into various coves to find them, blow them out of the water, and that pretty much ended the, uh, uh, and ended the war. Now, there are still a couple, uh, very few historians who say business had nothing to do, the business community had nothing to do with the Spanish-American War. And their argument is, well, you know, the outcome is uncertain, and that creates disorder rather than order. Most historians reject that interpretation completely because, as I indicated earlier, the outcome was never, never, ever in doubt but that the United States would win. And when we see the results of that war as far as American business, well, that tells a lot of the story. One of the figures involved in the war was an up-and-coming uh, politician who at this point was in the McKinley administration as Assistant Secretary to the Navy. Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And a couple of things happen here. One is that he's dying to get into the war. Can't wait to get into it. He loved war. So he has a ranch over in Arizona. His name was Theodore Roosevelt, by the way. <laughs> he has a ranch in Arizona. And he gathers his cowpokes together. They give themselves the name the Rough Riders. They get to the debarkation point to get to Cuba, American soldiers, in Tampa. And he pulls his weight, a political weight, to get on board because the, 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 the army officers says, get out of here, you know, with your drunken cowpokes and so on. He gets on board, gets to Cuba, and has his moment of glory. The famous charge up San Juan Hill which became an image of a picture that was on thousands of mantelpieces of him riding his horse and the horse rearing up and his sword flailing and so on. The fact of the matter is that it wasn't a difficult hill to get taken and that there, and when the armed forces were still se were segregated, as they would be until uh, after World War II, a black regiment, in fact, had been to the top of the hill first, got no credit at all. But Roosevelt, when he got to the top, called in the photographers, put his foot on some dead, and said, come look at the damn Spanish dead, and pictures are taken, and all of that, which increased his popularity uh, uh, tremendously. The war ends. Now, what's going to be done with Cuba? And the charges were increasing in the United States and in other countries, that the United States was becoming an imperialist country, a country out for empire, uh, just like uh, England and France and Belgium and Italy and Portugal and all those European company, uh, countries were doing, divvying up Africa and all of that. The United States is just one more imperialist country. To thwart that argument, and that argument, by the way, was pretty widespread against American imperialism, and the two most famous people who were part of that argument were an unlikely couple, if you will, Andrew Carnegie, the head of U.S. Steel, and maybe the most famous man in America at that time, Mark Twain, who argued that Mark Twain had a very salty tongue in terms of writing about the United States as simply another imperialist power. 
Well, to thwart that notion, Congress passed two amendments to two bills. Very important. The first, named after its sponsor, was called the Teller Amendment, T-E-L-L-E-R, the Teller Amendment. And it said, when Spain is defeated and leaves Cuba, Cuba will have its independence. Don't call us imperialists. Cuba will have its independence. But the more important amendment to notice is also named after its, uh, its, its sponsor, and the name just flew right out of my head. I've been talking about this for 50 years. It'll come to me. It'll come to me. Named after its senatorial uh, sponsor. It's, it's one of my senior moments. In any case. The uh, Platt Thank you. Who said that? Thank you very much. The Platt Amendment. P-L-A-T-T. -T. Bless you. <laughs> Women run the world. <laughs> Listen carefully to what the Platt Amendment says. You've heard the Teller Amendment. Listen to the Platt Amendment. If independent Cuba cannot manage its economy well, the United States reserves the right to unilaterally go into Cuba and fix its economy. <laughs> and now I will state what I consider to be a truism something that's always true. If a country is not in control of its own economy, it is not truly independent. It may be technically so, but not truly so. That Platt Amendment is a key. A key. And we will see it in operation subsequently. Another point that needs to be mentioned is that when we look at the racial makeup of Cuba, you have you have all the slaves and their descendants who came uh, to Cuba. Now Cuba is independent. And pure whites were a minority of the Cuban population. What Americans feared, particularly the American South, was an independent Cuba would eventually be run by black people. And that was an intolerable thing as far as the United States generally was concerned. Now, as to the question of the business community and the Spanish-American War, well, a number of things. First of all, food for the military in Cuba. And we're talking here about meat. And the problem was that the meat that was sold to the army by those Chicago meatpackers with an armor and so on. It got the name of bad beef. Because, how do I put it delicately, the steer was left a few days before the processing began. Sure. So putrefaction had set in and it was bad beef. Here's a little known statistic about the Spanish-American War. More Americans died, soldiers died of food poisoning than from Spanish bullets in that war. If I could give a cheap line, I would say that the companies made a killing on the war, but that would not be in good taste uh, to do it all, so I won't say it. <laughs> now, that word empire, what did the United States get? out of the Spanish-American War. They got Puerto Rico. But what was even more important was the Pacific. Remember, this is before the airplane. Naval power is considered the great power. Theodore Roosevelt was very enamored of a book by an Admiral Mahan about the influence of sea power uh, in history. So, we took Hawaii. We took Samoa. We took Guam. And by the way, before I get to the next big one, let me say a word about Hawaii. Again, there's a debate among American historians for, for, for generations whether business has an influence in politics. Seems to me a silly thing to even question, <laughs> but in any case, one of my answers to that statement that they don't have an influence in politics 
is to mention the name of the first colonial governor when Hawaii became a territory of, 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 uh, of the United States. His name was Dole. Dole, as in pineapple, yes. <laughs> now, going across the Pacific, because since the mid-1800s, that early on, when we took California from Mexico in the Mexican War, there were people in the mid-century, politicians, business people, who were saying then, on to China, on to China. China, the most populated country in the world, just dying for American goods, industrial goods, agricultural goods, China. And so, in that march across the Pacific, we had the question of the Philippines. The Philippines. And if you look at a map, the Philippines are certainly a gateway to China. In fact, before the war started, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt, when the, when the Naval Secretary was home for the weekend, Roosevelt sends a, a, sends a message to Admiral George Dewey, get your fleet to Manila Harbor and sit there and wait. In other words, the notion of going into the Spanish territory was already clear to people like Theodore Roosevelt. What to do about the Philippines? Far removed from the Cuban issue, what to do? Well, this is what President McKinley said. And I'm almost quoting him verbatim. Last night, he said, I got down on my knees and I prayed to God. And I asked God what to do about the Philippines. And God answered me. And he said, take the Philippines, civilize them, and Christianize them. Now, I don't know about you, but my notion of God is omniscient, all-knowing. So you'd think that God would know that the Philippines had been Christian for many centuries since Spain first got there in the 1500s. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> now, the Spanish-American War over Cuba lasted a few months, but the Philippines is a whole different matter. When Spain was forced out of the Philippines, the Filipinos, this is it, independence for our country. The American army said no. And what followed was a rebellion that lasted more than a decade. It was brutal. The Filipinos were fighting classic guerrilla warfare. Knowledge of the land, hit and run. They had a charismatic leader, his name was Aguinaldo, who survived all this, lived till I think the 1960s. For 10 years, how do you put down a popular rising? How do you put down guerrilla warfare? In a word, brutally, brutally. It may surprise you to know that the U.S. and the Philippines established something which we associate with a later event, but the term was used back then, and I mean concentration camps. Concentration camps, the, word, the term was used back then. Get the peasants who they can't support the guerrillas, put them behind barbed wire where they died like flies. It was brutal until finally, after more than a decade, they were put down and the territory, the U.S. territory, uh, could be uh, established. Now, getting back to the Caribbean. Why all this interest? I mentioned American business, uh, sugar, oil refining, and things like that. But in a more general sense, it's important to note that once the United States industrialized, and the big industrialization period is after the Civil War, the last third of the 19th, uh, of the 19th century, that as goods can be produced in much, much greater quantity, machine-produced goods, you need a market for those goods. That's an issue that's still very much a part of world capitalism uh, today. You need a market to sell those goods profitably profitably. 
Well, American workers increasingly in the factories were paid less than a minimum wage. They were paid what's, what's called a subsistence wage, basically, which means enough, enough money to put food in your bellies and come to work the next day. And that's it. And that's it. So, American capitalism is able to produce a tremendous amount of goods increasingly. Where to sell it profitably. In other words, we're now talking about the beginnings of a need for a world market a market beyond the borders of the United States. Foreign trade for the United States triples between the end of the Civil War and 1900. In addition to a market for American goods, and other industrial countries, of course, are doing the same thing, you need a source for raw materials. Now, the United States is fortunate in terms of having a plenty of oil and other kinds of minerals. It doesn't have rubber can't grow rubber trees uh, in the United States. In other words, there's a need in certain areas, certain, certain exotic minerals necessary for certain industrial production, to find these things overseas. That's another impetus in terms of that outward reach, the notion of empire. Now, again, as far as the Caribbean, that whole area, the United States had a special interest uh, in, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Latin America. And you see this clearly with the president, for example, like Theodore Roosevelt when he became president. Well, when we deal, when we negotiate with the Europeans, we're dealing with equals. So we sit down at the table and talk it out. Another uh, rival, increasing rival, was, uh, was Japan, for example. Well, Japan, uh, we look down on them. Racially, they're inferior to us, but they're powerful. So we need to negotiate with them. But as far as Latin America is concerned, there was utter contempt. Utter contempt. They're backward. They're stupid. They're lazy. And we can run roughshod over them. Again, even going back to that mid-19th century point in time, you had serious people who were saying, after the Mexican War, where we took one-third of Mexican territory, all that southwest, including California, that all belonged to Mexico. There were those who were saying, we should simply keep marching south until we get till, to Tierra del Fuego, the tip of Argentina. Take it all over. Now, practically speaking, it wasn't possible. There was even talk about going into Cuba then, in the 1850s, and before the Civil War, and dividing it up into four states. They'd be slave states, two senators from each state, and that would strengthen the southern interest, the pro-slavery interest uh, in Congress. Didn't happen because that was something the North couldn't quite uh, swallow. Now what happens after the Spanish-American War? What to do about these areas of, of Latin America? You have two policies that are working more or less in tandem with each other. And the terms are dollar diplomacy and secondly, gunboat diplomacy. These are the terms that were used. They're both straightforward to define. Dollar diplomacy simply means that American foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis this or that Latin American country will be dictated by the dollar. Translation, American business interests in that country. That will determine American government's foreign policy toward that country. What is in, in, for the good of American business investment in that particular country. <coughs> dollar diplomacy. Gunboat diplomacy, as the title indicates, means the equivalent of sending the Marines. If there should be an uprising in any of these countries, worst comes to worst, we will send in troops. Now what was established, what was established in Latin American countries after the Spanish-American War was really something very clever, something very clever. Uh, the term often used was the open-door policy. 
which said, well, we respect the independence of these countries, but we want to be able to trade with them. We don't want to be shut out. Don't close the door on us. We want to be able to trade. Sounds innocent enough. But here was the reality. What I described in terms of the Platt Amendment with Cuba, unofficially, often reflected what we did in other Latin American countries. Which is to say, as American business was investing in whether it's Cuban sugar, whether it's a Brazilian uh, coffee, uh, whether it's copper in Chile, whatever the case might be, we would find some native of that country to come to power. Usually a military figure. <coughs> there's, there's a Spanish term, uh, cardio, in terms of military dictators. Come to power. We'd arm him and when this is before the Russian Revolution, we can't even use the excuse, well, you know, the commies may take over. There was no Russian Revolution yet. But there were peasants. And the treatment of the peasants by the local armies, by the American business people in that particular country, <coughs> were generally horrendous. So we armed this military dictator. And if there are any <coughs> uprisings by these peasants against American companies, we have that native dictator to put it down. Since he's native to the country, the United States would argue over and over, Don't, you can't call us imperialists. We didn't take over the government of that country. Look, it's a native ruler of that country. But remember what I said earlier, that truism that I tried to uh, express. Now, if that local dictator, almost by definition unpopular, that the peasant uprising is too much for him, well, in the early days, he always had a boat nearby. He already had his Swiss bank account ready. And he'd take off to a life on the Riviera or whatever. Now, and later on, it was a jet plane uh, ready uh, for, that, for that exit. But in many cases, increasingly, what the United States would resort to was gunboat diplomacy. It's a long list. It's a long list. Uh, in Cuba, military intervention. In Honduras, in Haiti, in Nicaragua. In Nicaragua, we sent in the troops in 1912. We left in 1925. And then had to come back in 1927 and stay for another decade or, or so. Commonplace. Gunboat diplomacy. So what happens as far as Cuba is concerned? Would it always be gunboat diplomacy? No. No. In the debate over the League of Nations after the First World War, there was intensive debate in the United States in terms of what the United States position vis-a-vis -vis the world should be. Uh, President Wilson, who, who created the idea of the League of Nations, he said, there should be a League of Nations because we, the United States, in the aftermath of the First World War, which weakened European countries, we will be the strongest country in the world and we can tell the world what to do through the League of Nations. The world is our oyster. And the League will be the way to dominate around the world. But others disagree. An influential senator at the time from Massachusetts, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, says, no, no, no League of Nations. That's like a debating society. What we need to use is force to get our way around the world. And then you have a politician who's rising in a decade. He'll be president of the United States, Herbert Hoover, who already had a lofty uh, reputation at this time. He says, no. I'm opposed to the League. That's not the way to dominate. I'm opposed to military intervention. My solution is economic and political pressure. Economic and political pressure that we could exert to get things our way in countries around the world. I must mention that there were elements in this country, including some important people in the Senate. Any of you ever uh, know the name Robert La Follette? He was a senator from uh, Wisconsin, very, very influential figure. People like him said, we shouldn't intervene in the rest of the world. These tended to be progressives. They, they tended to say, we need our own house to fix up before we tell the rest of the world what to do. Our system may be best for us, but not necessarily for everybody else. 
We can't be policemen to the world, people like La Follette uh, said. Now, so there's choices in terms of the United States' role in the world. And as far as Cuba is concerned, I mentioned earlier there was some military interventions. But an interesting crisis took place in the early 1930s. A Cuban was uh, elected to power, his name was Grauma San Martin, and he said, you know, Cuba ought to control its own economy. And of course that meant primarily sugar. Well, the United States doesn't like to hear that. What did they do? In this case, they didn't send in the Marines. They sent a diplomat. And the diplomat meets with the head of Cuba and basically puts the squeeze on. Where is a, where is a lot of your market for sugar? What, what kind of economic uh, influence do we have as far as, as your exports are concerned? True enough, the United States is the answer. We can put the squeeze on you. And Gros Martin, San Martin, uh, 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 he, uh, he capitulated. Capitulated. In other words, Hoover's notion of that kind of economic pressure, short of military intervention. So what you have in Cuba, as well as in many other Latin American countries, are these military dictators. And they all make their deals with the United States. They become rich. They're given all kinds of money from the United States. Keep those people down. And we finally come to a figure in that respect by the name of Fulgencio Batista. Army man, again typical, who becomes the head of Cuba. And he has a cordial relationship with the United States, cordial relationship with American business, and, if you remember Godfather II, a cordial relationship with the mafia. <laughs> the mafia. Because Havana was considered an open city, an open city uh, in terms of, of drugs and, and prostitution, money laundering, gambling, all kinds of things. It was a haven as far as the Mafia was a concern. So what happens? There is an uprising. And it starts in the 50s, and it's led by a man by the name of Fidel Castro. And he gathers a bunch, not many people at all. They land on Cuba. They almost drown before they even get there. And they're in a kind of, a, of um, a rural area. And they start guerrilla tactics. They start, they attack a, an army barracks here and there and so on. Uh, there's fighting, they hit and run. <clears throat> it's a very slow operation, which will take years. But Batista in power, cocky, confident, doesn't take them too seriously, figure there's just a handful of rebels that we can wipe out. They don't wipe them out. And the longer they last, the increase of their, of their influence in terms of people saying, you know, maybe this is an answer to all these military dictatorships that we have culminating in uh, Batista. So at first, it's a rural movement of classic guerrilla warfare, but eventually it reaches into the cities in terms of those who join this effort a kind of uh, urban guerrilla warfare, if you will. And it's getting stronger and stronger. Until finally, New Year's Day, 1959, they're strong enough to march into Havana. Up until then, and we see this classically in a lot of uh, uh, guerrilla revolutions, for example, China. China. They've been, civil war been going on for decades. But it's always in the outlying areas. And so the world media would look at the cities and the palace of, of, of the leader of, of, of China and say, well, you know, they're, they're, they're not entities, these rebels out there. Only at the very end of the struggle do they actually enter into the uh, urban uh, centers. And that's what Castro did. And there's a parade, and he's greeted with open arms, and Batista makes his uh, hasty exit. He gives up the fight out of the country. What will the United States do as far as Castro's Cuba is concerned at the outset? <clears throat> Remember what I said a moment ago in terms of the United States being the most important market for Cuban goods. Castro expresses a fervent desire to maintain 
this market to maintain decent relations with the United States. Let bygones be bygones. However, what they demand is internal independence. In other words, independence from the United States economic controls that have existed uh, for uh, decades. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And so, the plan is started by President Eisenhower. It's continued by uh, President uh, Kennedy uh, in terms of uh, invading uh, Cuba, military invasion of Cuba. We believed our own rhetoric that Castro was hated by the Cuban people. They would all rise up and help to throw him out at the outset of his uh, revolution. <coughs> and so who would be in this invading force? You'd have Cuban exiles. And indeed, when Castro came to power, there were a significant number of exiles who fled mostly to the United States, to uh, centers like, like Miami, uh, Union City, Elizabeth, and so on. Many of them were middle class people or upper class Cubans who owned land, who had wealth, and a lot of that was confiscated by the revolution. And they were forced to flee, and needless to say, they were bitter and would remain bitter for the rest of their lives as far as this revolution that deprived them of that property and that, uh, that wealth. So they're part of the invading, uh, invading uh, force. The whole thing is organized by the CIA. And they land at a place called the Bay of Pigs. And they are utterly defeated. Utterly. Those who aren't killed or taken prisoner. It's a disaster as far as the United States uh, is, uh, is concerned. It also is a message to Castro in terms of that the United States will go to great lengths in terms of uh, eliminating him and his re revolution. So what the United States then does is to create an embargo. An embargo. In other words, basically to surround Cuba economically, to prevent other countries from trading with Cuba. Squeeze them, bleed them, and they'll give up. The choice that Cuba had at this moment was they're too strong for us, we give up. Or look for help elsewhere. And where they find that help is Russia. Russia has its own self-interest involved in helping uh, Cuba. That is to say, in terms of, uh, of a foothold in the Western uh, uh, Hemisphere. And so an arrangement is done between Cuba and Russia. And the arrangement goes something like this. As far as Russian foreign policy is concerned, or whatever they may say in the United Nations, Cuba will be an echo for that. Foreign policy, they will take whatever line Russia is pursuing at that particular time. However, and this was the difference between what, the, what Cuba had hoped for with the United States and failed to get, however, they will be free in terms of their internal revolution within Cuba itself. And that's the deal that Cuba makes with, uh, with Russia. So Russia will buy Cuban sugar, pay a higher than market price to sustain Cuba's economy. Now, what achievements were made? Some significant achievements need to be mentioned. First of all, in terms of health, health the embargo made until, until now, until recently, a shortage of medicines. A shortage of medicines. But as far as medical research is concerned, I don't know if any of you know about this because it's, it's pretty well publicized, Cuba is remarkable with all the pressure on them by the U.S., remarkable in terms of medical research uh, that is done there, and exporting doctors to certain African countries and things of that, of that, uh, of that nature. So in health, there was significant achievement uh, made. The kind of achievement that we might consider elementary, but for the Cubans, there's nothing elementary about it. In other words, if people are walking around barefoot, and they're near these bodies of water, and there are these parasitic worms that get into your body through your bare feet and cause an illness that dulls your mind. Well, the answer to that is to, to drain these swamps, 
and virtually eliminate the illness of these parasitic uh, worms. Inoculation, you don't need an MD to inoculate uh, a population uh, against the basic diseases, communicable diseases, and so on. And all this is done. What else? Education. Education. We're talking about a population with a large illiteracy rate among the uh, poor. Education. To elementary, high school, and college uh, education. What else? What else? The arts. There's a blossom in the arts. In fact, in, in, in any revolution, I mean, this can change. Like in Russia, in the early uh, decade, the, the first decade of the Russian Revolution, there was an explosion of, of artistic creativity. And eventually, with Stalin, you know, to conform, to conform, and so on. Well, in Cuba, whether we're talking about painting, whether we're talking about ballet, or whether we're talking about uh, orchestral uh, 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 efforts, uh, there's a great uh, uh, boom uh, in that. And last but not least to mention is the matter of race. Is the matter of race. The black population, or the mixed black and white population, may have been a majority of the Cuban people, but they generally represented the lowest class uh, in Cuba. And Castro had laws passed that were generally enforced in terms of wiping out that uh, racial, uh, those racist uh, notions that had uh, existed. These were real accomplishments. Now, a word about Castro. And here I'm going to generalize about revolutionary leaders who come to power. And so I can add to Castro uh, Mao uh, in China, a much larger, uh, a much larger uh, scale. The idea is this. What have they been doing up to the time they marched into Havana on New Year's Day, 1959? They've been leading this struggle against superior forces. It's brutal, and there's brutality on both sides, no question. Underground struggle. No holds barred. And they come to power, and they still have that mentality. What's the problem? The problem is that once in power, they still think in those terms, in terms of brooking no opposition, you see. No questioning. That military power that they had as a guerrilla leader becomes political and economic power as the ruler of a country. And it often doesn't turn out so well. what would be preferable, who's going to listen to me, in terms of a revolutionary <laughs> leader, what would be preferable, I would argue, historically is, they then turn over power to somebody who has the political and economic wherewithal to lead the country in this new phase, if you will, of the revolution. Now, I mentioned before that even with the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion, the United States many times attempted to assassinate Castro. All kinds of plots, real plots, to assassinate him. How was Castro to respond? They respond by tightening up the dictatorship in Cuba. You can almost map in Cuba its history under the revolution. When the United States eases up somewhat on its threats to Cuba, things open up more in Cuba. When the United States tightens the screws, or there's been another assassination attempt, the dictatorship is tightened. And opposition is not tolerated. You have prisons, brutal treatment, and all of the, all of the rest. Now, when communism fell in Russia in 1991, and that special partnership, as I described it, exists, uh, ended between the, Russia and, the, uh, and Cuba. That present, presented new problems with, uh, with Cubans. At one point, the United States, with its curious immigration policies, which I'll explain in a minute, we don't like the Cuban government. So, we are offering exile to the United States of all those Cubans 
who don't like living under Castro. This is known as the Mariel Flotilla, which you may remember. And what does Castro, how does he respond? Great. He loads on these boats every gangster, every criminal that they can find and puts them on the boat and they end up in Miami and Al Pacino, Scarface and all the rest of that. All the rest. He gets rid of all the criminal elements he can get a hold of. Now, this notion of American immigration policy on this kind of question is, is worth pursuing just for a moment, and that is, if we like the military dictatorship in a Latin American country, let's say El Salvador, or today Honduras, we like them. The conditions in that country are horrendous as far as the average person. You've got death squads, not safe to be outside. If you're trying to organize a, a block, you're trying to organize a union, you're not sure with your life. Four nuns go down to Nicaragua, marry no nuns, they get killed. I'm sorry, El Salvador, El Salvador, uh, you get killed. And Alexander Haig says, well, you go looking for trouble, you're going to find it. Nice, nice. Bishop Romero is saying mass, he's for the people, he gets assassinated by somebody who was trained at Fort Benning, Georgia. All this is going on. Immigration policy is such that countries that we like their military dictators, when people try to flee that and come to the United States, can't come in. Can't come in. But countries that we oppose their government, like Fidel Castro's Cuba, come on in, come on in, all of you. It's a very selective kind of immigration policy. Now, there are those who are going to ignore that immigration policy. You've got particularly church people on the border with Mexico. A lot of humane concerns in terms of, uh, in terms of, of, of desperate uh, immigrants who have come from Central America through Mexico to try to get into uh, the United States. Now, what has happened most recently? That initial generation of Cuban exiles here in the United States getting old, many of them dying eventually, bitter to the bitter end, hoping for the day, hope against hope, someday I'll return to Cuba, restore my land, restore my wealth, uh, and so on. They're disappearing. Up to this time, however, they've been politically useful in a demagogic way. In other words, you're running for office in Florida, you've got to be careful to denounce Castro and anything to connect it with the Cuban Revolution because you've got a constituency there of exiles that you do not want to offend. The younger generation of Cuban Americans, much more interested in normalization of relations with Cuba, and under certain presidents, uh, visitation uh, was, uh, was allowed uh, in ways that it hadn't been uh, before. With the Obama administration, you have a normalization of, of, uh, of relations with uh, Cuba. Castro lives to very old age, but dies. His brother takes over. He's probably not going to uh, be around that much longer. We really don't know what's going to happen when charismatic leaders eventually uh, die and are replaced. So, where are we today? With President Trump, I refuse to predict. Uh, I'll just have to check the tweet messages uh, and, and, and see what, what he came up with on the day. He has threatened to invade Cuba, has threatened to invade Venezuela, uh, and so on. He's just made Secretary of State, somebody who favors invasion of various uh, countries, head of the CIA, uh, ran torture places uh, during the Iraq War, and so on. Anyway, this normalization that took place under Obama, <coughs> a sellout to those Cuban exiles who've been deprived of, of their land and wealth in Cuba, it makes, and this kind of argument, it makes Obama a commie-loving uh, president. Let me make an analogy here to argue against this. In 1933, when Franklin Roosevelt became president, he officially recognized communist Russia for the first time since the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. And of course, he was called a commie lover and all of that. There's an analogy here between Roosevelt in 1933 and Obama recently. And that is, 
that the biggest pressure in both cases for normalization came from the business community. Mm -hmm. The business community. To get all that anti-commie uh, ideology and so on, it's bottom line, it's business. There's fortunes to be made in terms of opening up hotels, in terms of air routes uh, to uh, Cuba and all of that. All for it. All for it. No, I don't like Castro, I don't like communism, of course I don't. These pe business people say, but it's good business. And the rest of the world has normalized already relations with Cuba. We don't want them to hog the trade uh, with Cuba. We want a bigger piece of the action. Which may or may not give President Trump pause in terms of any kind of warlike uh, gestures uh, that may be made uh, in, the, uh, in the future. As far as the rest of Latin America is concerned, Castro's in Cuba making his revolution. Oh, by the way, the notion that always a communist, always uh, beholden to Russia, I don't think there's any evidence to indicate that at, at all. We're talking about a Cuban nationalist. He calls himself a communist, sure, after he has that deal with uh, Russia. But what does it mean? We have to examine what he stood for, what he did, what he didn't do, the pluses and the minuses. But when you get one of his important lieutenants, Ernesto Che Guevara, who is Argentinian, a doctor, Argentinian, not, not Cuban, who fights alongside Castro, Guevara's position is first Cuba and then other Latin American countries who are suffering. In fact, in fact, ironically, if you look at the, uh, of the state of living conditions, the Castro, the, the Cuban peasants were somewhat better off than some of the even poorer countries uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, the rest of Latin America. Guevara is going to go and help to spread revolution. And one of the places will be Bolivia, desperately poor country. And there the CIA hunts him down and he is, uh, he is, he is killed. But when the notion of the spread, and remember the U.S. interest in the various Latin American countries, the notion of the spread of it may happen, well, the United States is going to come down hard, particularly uh, in the Reagan administration, come down hard. And that's when you see military coups overthrowing civilian governments uh, in Brazil, uh, in Argentina, uh, Pinochet uh, in Chile, uh, in Uruguay. Brutal, brutal in the extreme with America's blessing, with America's blessing. I have close friends who are Brazilian, and he was in prison for a while, and he was lucky to get out before they started doing a lot of killing uh, in, in, in Brazil. Uh, and they told, uh, they told a story, which I was vaguely familiar with. <coughs> there was a CIA guy, his name was Vernon Walters. And what he would do is he'd visit various Latin American countries. Mm -hmm. And it got so that you could predict, uh-oh, there's going to be a military coup in a few weeks after Vernon Walters' visit. In other words, plotting, plotting with Brazilian uh, military, plotting with uh, Chilean uh, military, uh, uh, and so on. We espouse free elections. Salvador Allende was freely elected in Chile, who dared to say, you know, we've got a good percentage of the copper in the world, it should be owned by, Amer by Chilean copper, not by American copper companies. And so we arranged with military uh, in Chile, overthrow him, kill him, uh, and so on. And that pattern would follow. So what's the future? What's the future? It's very hard to say. It's very hard to say. Uh, the, the military uh, regimes that mostly began, at least in the, in, in the 1980s, in the fresh version of them, uh, were so inept, so inept, that eventually there was a return to civilian uh, uh, authority. How long that will last? Who knows? You've got the everlasting element of corruption. Brazil is in a real mess right now. Is it possible to say, well, you know, maybe we need a military strong man to come back? Can't tell. What role the United States will play with a un very unpredictable uh, president, uh, one cannot begin uh, begin to guess. Although some commentator, I guess I think it was last night, said something which I found quite, quite disturbing. Uh, putting Pompeo as the new Secretary of State, head of the CIA, who was involved in, 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 in some of the torture that was going on in, in, in Iraq, uh, 
uh, bringing in somebody uh, uh, to uh, head the CIA was also was more directly involved in torture and so on. This commentator said, you know what it looks like? It looks like a war cabinet. It looks like a cabinet of officials that are geared to uh, a, a war uh, mentality more so than the people that they, uh, that they replaced. Uh, it's an open question. It's an open question. But as I've always said, and I'll repeat it because I think it's worthwhile to repeat, and that is that history is not a science, but the more we know about that past, the more we have a better understanding of the present and maybe an inkling of the future. Thanks for your attention. Oh. Any quick questions before we have to uh, disperse? Any questions or comments? Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I had always thought that Castro was a communist leader. So you're saying that he really did not have a strong communist affiliation before the revolution in Cuba? Yes, that's right. That's right. In other words, officially, he does eventually call himself a communist. And it relates directly to the agreement with Russia. Yes, I'm a communist. And maybe even have said, I've always been a communist. But what did communism mean? I would suggest to you that communism, as the United States portrayed it in the whole Cold War era, is emanating out of Moscow, emanating out of the Kremlin. And I reject that notion. Because what you have to see, when you see revolutionaries in other countries, a much more important and useful word is the word nationalist. Nationalist. In other words, I would suggest to you Chinese communism, Italian communism, American communism, uh, Cuban communism, each is distinctive in terms of the conditions and the history of its, of its own country. If French communists were pretty much Stalinist, that certainly wasn't true of Italian communists, as an, as an example. As an example, as you may know or may not know, China and Russia have a long border. There's been skirmishes. They both call themselves communists. China invaded part of North Vietnam for a time. They both call themselves communists. In other words, you have to examine what they mean by it, what they did and didn't do, what their successes or failures uh, were. Castro starts out as a leftist, as a leftist. I'm sure he had socialistic uh, notions uh, in terms of, of, of the, what the achievements should be of the, of the revolution, but he is first and foremost a nationalist. Now, we can accept that, we can like that, or dislike it, as the case may be, as long as we understand that you cannot, a revolution is impossible if you don't have general support of the population. And a guerrilla revolution, like in China, or in Vietnam, or in Cuba, the peasantry, the peasantry. Without that support, they're going to get nowhere uh, at all. That's my understanding of it. Castro did take, did take over ownership of all the land. There wasn't, didn't he do away with private ownership? Of Not completely. The large estates, definitely. The large estates, uh, hotels in Havana, for example, he confiscated them. Hotels which said no blacks allowed, and so on. He got rid of that uh, right away. They're the private ownership, that's quite right. But small land holdings, were allowed to continue. But but the, the big land holdings, that was why you have such a disgruntled uh, exile uh, community. He definitely did away with that, and that was his intention. Again, we can accept that or reject it uh, as we uh, as we see the, uh, the situation. So the grabbing of large land holdings is not the definition of communism. I can point to the grabbing of land holdings that were done under capitalism. The Enclosure Acts in England, for example, get the peasants off the land so we landowners can take over a big block of land for our own, uh, for our own uh, uh, profit. Uh, that somebody may do that and call themselves a communist, yes, that's true, that's true. What else? Uh, yes, sir. I think I've asked this question before. Do you think that uh, the Cubans, the bad pigs, the uh, the whole thing with Batista and uh, being thrown out and Castro coming to power, do you think that had something to do with the Kennedy assassination? Oh, uh, the question, if you didn't hear it, was uh, did the, the Bay of Pigs disaster and, uh, uh, and the overthrow of Batista have anything to do with the Kennedy assassination? Uh, there's been a theory uh, uh, to that effect. Uh, and and the, the argument would be that, well, I'm Fidel Castro, and the United States has tried to kill me a number of times, well, I'm going to retaliate in terms of the assassination. I don't think so, uh, because 
I, I, no time to get into the Kennedy assassination except, except to say that I, I don't accept the official version uh, of it. But if you look at suspects in the Kennedy assassination, a fair number of them are Cuban exiles who hated Kennedy because Kennedy, there was rumors that Kennedy was going to begin to normalize relations with Cuba. Normalize relations. And for the exiled community, that was anathema. And so I think that's a more probable uh, kind of scenario. Uh, yes? Um, I'm concerned about what's happening with, in Cuba today with the... Um, oh, right. Yeah. Right. And I also want to say one other thing. Just like when you hear about Vietnam, at one point, Vietnam never would have changed if America hadn't um, pushed Vietnam into Ho Chi Minh, in other words. Ho Chi Minh and Castro seemed to me like they had something that they could have been um, not communist. Oh, yeah, the I, government didn't well, push them. Again, Ho Chi Minh called himself a communist. There's no question about that. But what did it mean to him? It meant get the French out of Vietnam and be independent. But to say that Ho Chi Minh was a lackey of the Kremlin is utter nonsense. Is utter nonsense. And I would argue that earlier on, I would say the same thing uh, as far as Castro is concerned. I must say that in terms of the, 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 the what, poisoning uh, in the uh, U.S. Embassy in Havana, I have not followed it. I have not followed it. Uh, I have not followed it closely. I can't verify uh, the significance of it or the cause of it. I must say that, without knowing any of the details, it would seem to be absolutely insane for the government of Cuba to instigate an issue with the United States to give them an opportunity to march in. It would be insane, and I don't think that. Whatever his faults are, I don't think Raul Castro is insane uh, to do something uh, like that. They, they learn, perhaps they learn, given what I've just argued, with the missile crisis. In other words, when Russia put missiles in Cuba, from Cuba's point of view, well, we need to be protected from the United States, which is 90 miles away. Obviously, the United States saw it differently, understandably. And, of course, we almost went to nuclear war with, uh, with uh, Russia. But in the deal between Kennedy and Khrushchev, first of all, Kennedy says, you know, get the missiles out uh, unconditionally. And Russia said, well, you know, you've got missiles in Turkey that are pointed toward us. And Kennedy actually said, well, those are good missiles. Yours in, in Cuba are bad missiles. But the result agreement, which prevented nuclear war, was the removal of missiles from Cuba and from Turkey, and, and this was crucial for Cuba, a promise not to invade Cuba. I had a friend who was in the Marines at the time, and he was on ship. He was headed toward Cuba. He was headed toward Cuba in terms of, of, of invading. But then the settlement uh, took, uh, took place. So Cuba, of course, would have been annihilated in any kind of nuclear exchange uh, with Russia uh, 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 back then. So one would like to think that they learned a lesson that you don't go to the brink of nuclear war with a power like the U.S. See, what's so sad about it is that when Obama opened it up, travel people did want to go to Cuba, and now it's getting their publicity. Yes, yes. We don't know if it's American. <laughs> I mean... Yes, it can change. It can change with the presence. I indicated Castro's response to a warming, a, a getting a more frigid uh, relationship in terms of opening things up, closing things up, uh, and, and, and so on. There's no doubt in my mind that the normalization of relations with Cuba has allowed Cuba in, within itself to open up more than it had done under the Castro, uh, the Castro uh, dictatorship. But if the United States, if Trump really is making, uh, making a major threat to Cuba, I can imagine things closing up. And it's understandable, if you will. In other words, if you're on the brink of war, the notion of, well, anybody can do whatever they want and so on, that becomes lessened in terms of the threat of, uh, the threat of war. Hopefully it won't happen. Anything else? Yes? on racial policy, you know, and racial relations. Just, you know, what a comment before we might respond. Back in the 70s, mm -hmm. when I saw the Cuban ballet, the, the, the big national company, yes. by Alicia Alonso, um, and, and the training school there, I was really impressed by the fact that a majority of people in the company were black, 
um, a lot of them really dark skin, some mm -hmm. black people, mm -hmm. and then there were some lighter and a few mm -hmm. white people. When the company came a few years ago to city center, there wasn't a single dark skinned black person there. Everybody you mean the was, audience. No. Oh, in, in the ballet. In the ballet, it was almost entirely white by appearance. How many, least, how many years had passed? 30. And uh -huh. the, the black people had disappeared from, you know, from the company. I, I do not know. I have to plead ignorance, but that's certainly a disturbing, really uh, disturbing fact of what might happen under 30 years. Uh, you know, the best laid plans, the best, best efforts may eventually may eventually uh, fail in terms of, uh, of, uh, of an end to uh, racial, uh, racial uh, attitudes. Uh, I did not know that, and I'm, I'm uh, thank you for your support. The dancers that have left since then are dance with companies in America, San Francisco Ballet, Boston Ballet, right. are generally white by appearance, right. at, at least. Right. Um, Carlos Acosta is, is black, but he left. You know, he, yeah. he defected and his, his book in No yeah. Way Home. There right, right. So, One of the factors of leaving, of course, is that when you have this kind of dictatorship, Russia is the primary example, particularly in terms of ballet, is uh, I don't, I'm a creative person, I'm a creative artist, I don't like the restrictions, I'm leaving. Sometimes they do it for money, but otherwise for creative reasons. And, 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 and Russian ballet, I mean, Marishnikov and Nureyev and so on, they, 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 led, uh, they left for greater freedom from their, from their perspective as creative, uh, as creative people. But uh, I'll take your word for it, and uh, uh, I'm disappointed, but not shocked in the sense that if you look at the scope of history, you find idealistic efforts ultimately not succeeding. Not succeeding, and, and we could point to that uh, in all kinds of places in the world. Yes. In relationship to racial issues, can you speak to the leaving of the many Jews during Castro's? Leaving Cuba. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there, I would say I, I don't think the issue is particularly uh, anti-Semitism. I think it's a matter of economy. Economy. In other words, the Jewish population of Cuba tended to be either middle or middle upper, uh, upper upper class and they suffered they suffered as the people that I described suffered in terms of confiscation and they left and they left right. uh, I mean Cuba was and still is a very much a Catholic country but Castro his notion was well you know the Pope is not going to dictate what we do with our revolution here uh, in, in Cuba uh, but uh, that that's my sense of, of why uh, Jews would have left uh, as well, along with others of that class. Anything else? It's, it was interesting what you said about the medical um, thing, because there were many temples I know that were bringing medicines over to Cuba and within the last few years. Yes. And yet they do have such wonderful doctors, and um, I was wondering how that Well, the, the, uh, uh, In other words, is, is there universities? It's, it's a matter of emphasis and support in terms of the medical profession and support from the government, from that dictatorial government. This is something that we support, and it's beneficial. Now, as far as the shortage of medicines, that has to do with the embargo in terms of the restrictions, in terms of sufficient medicines uh, getting uh, to them. So it's not necessarily a contradiction. And, 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 and in fact, doctors are exported exported to African countries, for example, and some Americans go to Cuba for treatment in terms of, 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 uh, of uh, treatment of certain diseases that is not officially recognized uh, in the United States, but has been shown, in, not just in Cuba, but in uh, parts of Europe, uh, to be effective to get decent uh, treatment at a fraction, at a fraction of the cost of, uh, of the U.S. Anything else? No. No. Okay, you. see you in the fall. <laughs> Gee, I don't know. <laughs>